website at lbc.co.uk and the LBC YouTube and uh, Facebook feeds. Now with me in the studio, Tim Farron, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nelifar Hadiat, who is a broadcaster and journalist, Cindy Yu from The Spectator, and also the journalist and broadcaster Mike Parry. Welcome to you all. Well, let's get cracking, shall we? Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Tweet at LBC. Text eight four eight five zero. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Um, right, let's. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't. We've been in such a hurry, we haven't provided our guests with their headphones yet. So they to, they fish their own out. We have to. Um, right, let's go to the first question. I'll repeat it, and we'll put those on, on later. Right, um, let's go to Chris in Croydon. Chris, hi. What would you like to ask? Oh yes. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Yes, my question is this: um, Does the panel agree that the government's proposed um, changes to human rights legislation is long overdue. Does the panel agree that the government's proposed reforms to human rights legislation are long overdue? Tim Farron. Uh, no, uh, it's a short answer. Um, I often ask people who get concerned about human rights legislation which particular one of the rights they're not happy with um, and they find it very difficult to do so what they will often do is point out individuals they do not like uh, or do not agree with who have been uh, had their rights protected at some point whatsoever some uh, what, at some point in the past i think the thing to remember is if you believe in human rights, um, then you have to believe in them for everybody, not just people like you, not people who agree with you. I'm going to say that anybody can agree with people and defend the rights of people with whom they've got a lot in common, who they're ideologically or for religious purposes or whatever else, feel they're on the same page. The key test is whether you are a liberal, is are you prepared to fight for the rights of people who are not like you? who think things very different to you. Uh, so no, I, I'm, I fear that it, the um, assault on human rights and human rights legislation comes from a place of trying to be performative to the electorate, to play to a gallery that thinks that there's somehow a situation where lots of terribly bad people are getting away with terribly bad things and it's all the fault of the liberal intelligentsia for letting them. A lot of people will say, well, why should anyone have a human right to a family life if they've committed a terrorist offence? I think, so obviously when all's said and done, people who are found guilty of offences are to be uh, dealt with via justice. Part of human rights is that there is justice. Part of the human rights are those who are offended against and everybody else in society who in one sense has been offended against uh, too. Their rights matter also. And so that a person should bear a penalty is significant, but at no point, and is massively important, but at no point do we say this person is not a human being. And whilst we recognise that person as a human being, even in their incarcerated state, uh, their punished state, their justly punished state, they have some rights because they are and bear the dignity of being a human being, irrespective of what they've done. Mike Parry, I suspect you might disagree with some of that. Well, what was the original question, please? I didn't the original on. question was, does the panel agree that the government's proposed reforms to the Human Rights Act yeah. are long overdue? Um, look, human rights are a basic right to everybody, I totally agree. I think the problem with this country is we are the fairest democracy in the world. We are the most liberal with a small L liberal country in the world. That's why we've got more protesters in this country than any other country. That's why Inchalate sit down on the M25, because they know that basically the police are more inclined to give them a biscuit and a cup of tea than to rip their hands off the tarmac, which are stuck to the tarmac with superglue. So what I would say is that one of the main reasons I'm delighted that we have come out of Europe, I'm not delighted for every reason we've come out of Europe, one of them is we can now start sorting out our, our own human rights issues here, including, and this has come up that, in the last couple of days... That's nothing to do with Brexit. Uh, no, 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 hang on, hang on. What I'm saying is including deciding how many people will let in and out of the country as and when we want to, open the door or shut the door as to our needs, not just having a huge, you know, wide open door all the time for everybody. You know, yes, human rights have got to be reformed in this country. Yes, they're important in a civilised society, but please don't take advantage of them the way people take advantage of us for being nice in this country. How have people been taking advantage of us? People take advantage of us here because they know that they're not going to get beaten up when they sit on roads. I say to these insulate people, and I've said it for many years now, not just because the insulate people are here, what you're protesting about is something that happens in another part of the world. 
why don't you go to that part of the world, i.e. China? Why don't you try and sit on some roads in China and glue your hands to the road? You will get a completely different response. You will get broken skulls and you get dragged off and you get jailed for 10 years. That's what I mean about the human rights in this country being, in my view, a bit too easy on those who disrupt, who disrupt okay. our society. George on Twitter says, except for minorities, they must be crushed. That's something that you said a couple of weeks ago. I, I was on what a television show. Uh, uh, well... Let's put it into context, context, okay? First of all, somebody took a seven-second clip and put out just that statement. It was in the midst of a conversation about how our lives are disrupted, and at the time it was the height of the insulate protests on the M25, mm. and I made the point that I'm sort of making now, that the problem is in this country you get tiny minority protest groups who, because we're so kind and so gentle, we allow them to massively disrupt our lives. When you stop the M25 in this country, it's tantamount to stopping the heart in a human body because everything else stops. The queues went 60 miles back up the M1 because of the protest on the M25. That shouldn't be allowed for people who, frankly, have, have got some kind of argument which they can't okay. produce facts or statistics for. Cindy. Mm. Well, I, I can definitely see where Mike's coming from um, when, when you talk about the disproportionate uh, impact of some of these protests. But, you know, I'm glad you brought up China because I think China's really interesting and Ian, it won't surprise you to, to hear that, you know, I often think about things in the context of China, I think about things in this country in the context of China. And look, you're right, protesters in China would be dragged off the streets and probably faced with police brutality. But that's even more reason for us here to not treat them in the same way. Because I don't want to treat we... them this way. I want them to know that not abuse the freedom Freedoms that are here by having sure sensible protests, and not those, not those. Okay, that, I'm sorry, not, not those that that you know impair the lives of millions of people. Yeah, I'm not sure traffic jam does impair it the does. lives <laughs> of does. millions of people. I, I totally accept that, like, you know, ambulances and paramedics, and we've yep. seen all those videos online um, of, of Insulate Britain um, stopping that, and obviously that is a red line that should be drawn. But yes, my point about China is more, in order to criticise around the world for people not being perfect on human rights, we have to be perfect on human rights, or at least as perfect as we can be, or at least trying to be. You know, Dominic Lawson wrote a really interesting column in the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago mm. about the Chinese Communist Party's argument when it comes to Americans torturing t terrorist suspects. And, you know, how can we point the finger at China when we've got things like Guantanamo Bay? So I just think, like, obviously it's not on the same scale, but everything when we're doing, we need to be better than that mm -hmm. if we want to criticise people around the world. Um, and, you know, we can talk about okay. climate in China as well later if that well, comes I mean, up. We, we may well do. Mm. Uh, Nalafal. I have to say, as, uh, as a refugee to this country, um, it's one of the things that I'm most proud about, being British. It's one of the things I've inherited, one of the things I've learned. I'm looking at you, Mike, because I'm telling you this. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm taking it in, believe me. As a person who was born in a country that because of my very gender, because of my sex, I, I would have been brutally mistreated, if not killed, in the way that um, Afghan women are nowadays. I have a very privileged position to sit on and say we should be proud of allowing those people um, of Inshallah to go out on the streets. Yes, some of the things they did are bonkers. I don't agree with, we can all agree to that. But when even I stand, Tim agrees, even yeah. Tim agrees, <laughs> there you go, consensus, no one right. believed it, no one believed it. But I don't want to ever be America. I don't want to pay lip service with these ideals that we never reach with this shining house on a hill that we never get to go inside What's wrong of. With ideals? Because they're not good enough in practice. The reason that human rights law, and by the way, the European human rights law, we wrote it. Britain wrote the majority of the European human um, of the laws that govern the rights of individuals in Europe. Those are ours. We crafted those. And as yeah, an immigrant, been abused. as an immigrant, I'm proud of that. Yeah. How they're abused, when they're abused, and what we do with each incident, yes. that's up to the collective to decide. But pointing to China or Afghanistan and being mm. like, no, 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 be careful, or you're going to get sent to this country or that country, or look yeah. at them, look how badly they're treated. Yeah. That's playing to the worst parts of humanity rather to the best parts uh, uh, that I love being uh, British. Uh, uh, hang, hang on Sorry. a second, Mike. Um, t Tim Farron, there aren't any votes in this, though, for you, are there? I mean, th th if you ask the great British public what they, v what they think, 
I think a lot of them would be on Mike's side on this. Yeah, possibly. Um, doesn't mean you should take that position, no, though. No, but how do you convince people of the rightness of your argument? That's the challenge, isn't it? I mean, it gets what we're talking about here. Are we talking about the, the freedoms of people to protest, the fact that human rights should be afforded to everybody, not just people we like and agree with? I think we have to remind ourselves, again, I think the comparison with countries that are totalitarian states is a really bad one. You know, we don't want to be just a bit better than them. And, you know, I don't know if you know loads more than I do, but when I've met refugees who were heading for the UK or had come to the UK, why do they want to come here? They've never heard of the NHS, they've never heard of benefits, they've heard of yes. a country where it is safe to raise your kids, where there is religious tolerance and where you can make a living and build a life without being persecuted. Get a job, I agree. Don't you think you should be really flipping proud that that's the image we have well, overseas? Why look, would we undermine I it? I absolutely do, but... Um, for areas of the country, I mean, yours is one of them. I mean, you, you, you represent a very rural constituency. There will be many people in your constituency that have never met a refugee, that, that don't probably have any understanding of why they've done what they've done, and will mm. probably... I mean, I'm not impugning your constituents, but you know, you, 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 know, you know that there are lots of people who have an automatic... Yeah gut reaction they what they're that they're in. coming here to fleece the benefits. Yeah. So, I mean, we have an advantage. And so you're right in one sense. We're probably one of the least diverse bits of the United Kingdom. However, in 1945, half of all the children liberated from Auschwitz who came to the United Kingdom came to Windermere. Mm. And the Windermere boys, and still some of them with us today, um, are a, rem a reminder of what we're like at our best. A reminder of what we're like at our best. And I t I tend, if I tell my kids... Um, about the thing that they did that was good, they're more likely to repeat that thing. Mm. And I, so I think there is a... You've got to understand where people are coming from uh, because part of the job of people in politics sometimes, I don't agree with it, and I try not to do it myself, is to divide and rule. And so you see where this comes from and you see it in the media as well. Our job is to remind people of the Britain that is at its best. Ian, when you just said, um, you know, some people may say, oh, refugees, they come here, they just want a free living, that kind of stuff. Just in case anybody thinks I'm like that, it's completely the opposite for me. This country was at its best when the service industry in this country was staffed largely by people from Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Believe me, they are better at serving drinks and serving meals in restaurants than anybody I know. And in this country, it's regarded as rather a low. There'll be a lot train. of Australians very offended by <laughs> <laughs> that. <laughs> there, will, there will be, but what I'm saying is, my attitude is is absolutely along the lines of what Tim's saying. I think if somebody makes the decision to displace themselves from the home being brought in, we all grow up in a culture which you find very hard to take off and go and adopt a new culture, it's because they want to better themselves. And when you see fantastic business success stories in this country, the two chaps who've just acquired Asda for 6.7 6 billion quid, they're refugees, mm. you know, and their parents are refugees. And, well, and, and, they're blackburn lads. I, I'm, I, hoping, listen, I'm hoping they want to buy a football listen, club. Listen, I feel my work here is done. I've got Mike Parry and Tim Farron to agree on something in the first question. Astonishing. Well, uh, I'm sorry to let you down. No, not, not at all. Um, Chris in Croydon, would you like to comment on your own question? Well, I, I, to, to my, my opinion, the panel got rather um, sidetracked on the issue of... Um, it happens. Ref ...refugees. <laughs> um, what, what I was um, think, thinking of was more that um, the liberal left in this country have undermined the whole basis of our morality, which is that every right predicates an equal and corresponding responsibility. Mm. And that is no longer recognised by the liberal left. Mm. Chris, mm. thank you very much indeed. Um, you were grimacing at that, anyway, I think. I just, why? Why? The right to an education doesn't bear the responsibility to do well at education. Mm. Um, yeah. The right to have uh, access to clean food and clean water doesn't mm. mean that you have to be a master chef. Mm. Th yeah. This assumption that you can only uh, get things that you deserve is, is a scarcity mentality and one of the least things, um, one of the least best things about this country, the, one of the best things at our best, yeah, yeah. Mike, is when we look to all the things that we are great at and one of the things that we are great at is understanding that there are basic innate oh, 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 rights I, I totally that agree. we should have you, you just said the human rights european human rights largely crafted in this country but that's to stop people being persecuted to stop discrimination religious sexual or otherwise right it is not to allow a prisoner to take the mickey out of the system by complaining he's got a lumpy mattress in his cell and would like another one. That's where it's abused. Right. That's well, where it's so badly abused. Uh, on that controversial note, <laughs> we're going to go to a break. It's quarter past eight. <laughs> this is LBC. Have
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 18 minutes past eight if you've tuned in late to the programme, and if so, why? Tim Farron is with us, former Liberal Democrat leader, broadcaster and journalist Nalafar Hadiat, and also journalist and broadcaster Mike Parry and the spectator columnist Cindy Yu. Mark's in Dagenham. Hello, Mark. Um, I'm in one to uh, Ian. Uh, Winston Churchill's old constituency. Uh, Indeed. Well, you want to ask me a question, and the question is... Um, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> Pull yourself yeah, the together. Question <laughs> is, the question is, I Run think all politicians, no, all politicians should have a minder or someone to protect them. They should never be on their own. And I'll tell you exactly why, Ian. Because my sister was a nanny, and she worked for two doctors. And she... There was a lovely lady, uh, this doctor, it was in East London, and then some years on, when my sister wasn't a nanny, she found out that she'd gone to assist someone, it was a junkie, and he stabbed her to death. And that ruling was that they uh, have, because she died, they always said that now, from that day, they had to have a, a, a driver. And a minder. Right. So the person does okay. the driving and he makes sure he looks after the doctor or whoever. And that is now legislation and that is why that was brought in due to that poor well, doctor who lost her life. Yeah. Well, it's a horrific story. Um, Cindy, you, you talk to politicians all the time. I'm not going to come to Tim first because I came to him first on the last question. But from the, what's your impression? Do you think that MPs are desperate to have close protection or minders at their surgeries? No, that's not the vibe that I get. I think people are incredibly sad about what happened to Mark Amos. And that means that, you know, people are thinking, well, how can we prevent this from happening? But also, what can we do so that the terrorist doesn't win? And I feel like to have a minder, to have increased security, or, or just anything that comes between the constituency and the MP um, is a victory, really, for, for terror in this sense. Um, because the you know the way our democracy works is so good because MPs are so accessible. You know, you, no matter who your MP is, you know you can see them at your surgery. And that's not the case across political systems um, across the world. You know, President Xi, when he when Wuhan was happening last year, was talked to doctors through a screen. You know, there was not that intimacy that this country's politics has. And I don't know if you guys remember that picture we had um, from the last election where Boris Johnson, having just won his constituency, was standing next to someone who was runner-up, dressing a cookie monster costume. And, you know, that's the kind of democracy that we have. It's difficult to tell the difference. <laughs> one was red, one was blonde. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's the kind of democracy we have, and to lose that would be incredibly sad. That's not to say that we just throw our hands up and don't do anything, but to have a minder, I don't think the MPs' families and the MP themselves would want that. I mean, I think the families actually, might, but yeah. I don't yeah, think the MPs I mean, would. Yeah. I mean, yeah, um, it's an incredible strain. Nalifah? It would be nice to have the option. I think, yeah, I think there's nothing yeah, wrong with question, um, taxpayers. I mean, it's, it's the easy answer, frankly. But it's um, in my in the job that I do as a journalist, I travel around the world. Um, I've been to Libya during the war. I've been to Afghanistan. I've, I've been to the mean streets of America, where, frankly, it's very, very dangerous sometimes. Um, and sometimes we do use uh, people who are there to look after our security deals, and sometimes we don't. It's our decision as a team, as a group. I think politicians, I, I was saying to Tim before we came in here, I could not do the job. It's mm. too much. But I'm, I'm sure to be at taxpayers' expense, offered the option, offered the opportunity um, for those who feel they need to take it and not. But where do you stop? Because councillors have surgeries, a lot of them mm. do anyway. Um, think of the cost of providing because I'm sure they've had incidents. They, they, we probably don't report them because we don't know about them, but I'm sure on a local basis, the local press will be full of incidents where councillors have been threatened because it, there's something... But, but tackling the issue shouldn't be something we're, we're scared of, right? You're, you're, you're suggesting, well, I think you're suggesting is, well, if we start here, where do we stop? Mm. When we think the problem is mm. solved, that's when we stop. Well, what's the difference between um, an MP surgery now and an airport? Because years ago, we all have been shocked when we walked into an airport and mm. suddenly for the first time saw a policeman with a machine gun yes. strapped across his chest. Mm. And you think, this is not Britain. This is not what mm. Britain should be. But we've got to accept the world is becoming a more dangerous place. I would put an armed police officer outside every political surgery, not just to protect the MP, but people are going to be frightened to go to surgeries if they think a maniac is running around looking to hurt the MP and could hurt any constituents mm. as collateral damage. I, 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 I know it's 
said, oh, you know, we don't arm the police in this country and all that. I think we've got to have another look okay. at security. Tim, from, from an MP's perspective, I mean, I've been saying over the weekend that th this is a circular argument here because in the end there is no solution. And if you have a police officer uh, present at every surgery, if you have bulletproof glass, as I think Diane Abbott was suggesting... Mm. I mean, you've lost the, the human contact, haven't you? And you will have been, well, you're probably going to say you haven't now, but many MPs I know, they tell me, and I've seen this for myself attending a few MP surgeries, that people come to an MP surgery because it's the surgery of last resort. They're at their wit's end. They've been let down by some government mm -hmm. department or whatever. And they can get very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there have been the times when you've gone around the table and given them a hug. Mm -hmm. Well... Th that would all go if they, if all of these measures well, were introduced. It, it? I think it would, yeah. Well, if the police were outside and they were vetting people coming in because... Well, it would put a lot of people off going in the first place. Yeah, well, exactly. the well, I think, well, I think, I think it might also make people feel safer to go if they knew that there is some, a much some higher it, level Some it of, would, of but, I mean, Diane Abbott, I mean, she, yeah. she represents a constituency in Hackney. She reckons that a lot of her constituents, if they saw a police officer, exactly. they just wouldn't go. Now, we can all debate why that would be, yeah, sure, but yeah. I think that's a consideration, Tim. But, yes, well... So so the first thing to say is that I think our, my, my first thought is not really for my safety, it's probably for my for my staffs and my, my families, I guess. Over the time I've been an MP, um, and actually just before, um, there have been, what, four uh, attacks on MP surgeries. Interesting, they're all, they all tend to be at a surgery. I mean, the, people could find us at the supermarket. Mm. Um, mm. People could, I mean, I go and take my A-board out on all the marketplaces and I'm always out and about. I'll, it's the bit I enjoy the most. I'd give up if I had to do it all from inside a, a locked room because mm. what's the point? Um, but it does appear that surgery are, are if, if four cases are a science, big enough scientific sample to say surgeries are the pinch points where these things happen. But they all, we don't know everything about um, what led to uh, the murder of David, but, but we do know that the four individuals who are guilty of those four events, um, you know, uh, uh, Nigel Jones, um, uh, Andrew Pennington, his, his assistant, uh, Stephen Timms, Joe Cox, and now sadly David Amos, uh, that, that there was a different story behind all of them. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's wise for us to be not complacent and this will make me not complacent for the good of my staff in particular when we go places. But I'm still going to do surgeries. And I won't say everyone's going to come by appointment because if I turn up in your village and you want to ask me something, I'm not going to tell you to come back next time. And I'm not going to stop being on the street corner. I'm not going to stop being accessible. I'm not going to stop living in my patch. I think that it doesn't mean I'm going to be reckless. Maybe I'll be a little bit less reckless than I've been. But for sure, um, you know, as long as I'm doing this job, I want to be immersed in the community I represent. Otherwise, kind of, what's the point? Mm. But I'm sure when MPs have the surgeries this coming weekend, a lot more will be mm. a little bit more careful. Mm. But in three months' time, in six months' well, time... Yeah. We're, I mean, so this weekend, um, I got a lovely call from the Chief Constable of Cumbria um, on Friday afternoon, um, and her team were on the phone to my office about security measures in the office, which is all reasonably good already. Um, and then I had a surgery and another the public event on the Saturday and the police were kind of in a fairly uh, unobtrusive way present at both. Um, I mean, the police officer who turned up my surgery wanted to know if I could be, he could be in the room with me. I said, no chance. <laughs> and so you refused that? Well, they, they hung around outside. Right. And it was fine as they had a chat with people well, in the room. It was all fine. Yes, he was uniformed. Mm. Um, and uh, But not in the room with us because people are going to potentially talk about unbelievably personal, yes. difficult yeah. stuff. Mm. I mean, sometimes people come as first resort and that's great. Mm. And I wouldn't want them to be put off because it's just you made the bar too high. Mm. But particularly people who have got serious mental health concerns mm. who are at the cusp of becoming homeless if not actually homeless massive um, issues to do with benefits things they don't want anybody to know about they're coming to talk to me the deal is me and my member of staff are the only people who will know sure. anything about but, but that Ian, you... until you know they give me permission otherwise mm. and it's not Sorry. that the police will be anything other than confidential mm. of course they will mm. but their presence could put people mm. off and I don't Mike. want that you made, you made a very good point there Inc. why not have policemen there who don't look like policemen but mm. they are protected the MP. I'm talking about plain clothes policemen. We know an awful lot of that goes on in this country, undercover police officers investigating drug gangs, all that kind of stuff. We've got people who are trained in doing that. Would that be a solution, Tim? If somebody came along they, in plain clothes, had a gun in his pocket like James Bond or something? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Uh, but in the end, um, I don't want to make this a zero sum because obviously there's a cost to everything and, yeah. and, and all that. 
But I will just point this out. There are people living in my communities, even a relatively peaceful one like South Cumbria, who are far more at risk than I am. Um, I might be exposed in a public place, but they will live in communities where crime is more prevalent. Um, and I would feel pretty guilty, mm. plain closed or fully uniformed or whatever, mm. of somebody spending their time protecting well, me. It's a hate I crime, think I'm isn't broadly, it? If you set out I'm, to injure an MP, it's a hate crime. And a hate a crime, crime is a, a growing, and is I, a growing and area you've got, of If you've got somebody what, what, on an estate where there are serious issues of, of drug dealing, of theft, of, of assaults on the person, the thought that I'd be borrowing their copper... Mm. I wouldn't feel safe. I wouldn't feel right doing that. I, I'm just thinking about the members of Parliament in Afghanistan, about mm. the dangers that they had to contend with over many, many years. And of course, could, I don't even know what's happened to the Afghan Parliament now. Presumably, it doesn't exist. It's scattered and shattered and 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 sent off in a myriad different directions. Mm. Um, I'm I'm in contact with at least three politicians, all of whom female, who two who are in America, one who's in a holding pattern in Albania until she finds somewhere to settle. Um, and they face this exact threat day in, day out. I mean, in 2000, uh, I think it was 2010 or 2011, I went to Afghanistan to make a film about uh, women uh, for the BBC. And these women were get getting regular bomb threats, regular uh, carjacking, threats against their children made, uh, kidnapping. They were being murdered and killed. And yet they continue to do their job. And, and Tim, um, I mean... <sighs> It's quite emotional to sit next to a politician here um, right now. And, he has that um, effect on a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Brings him to tears, does he? <laughs> um, but to, to hear you talk in that way, because it, it, I fear for you. I think the, the four of us here fear for you, but you're, you, are, you are sort of being valiant, if well, I may. Uh, no, I'm not. No, well, you are. No, because, no, well, no. The no, women because, you just spoken about, they're No, valiant. no, 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 because, because, because they were also being valiant in the situation they were in. You know, comparing mm. Afghanistan to Britain is apples and oranges doesn't make sense. Mm. But the point is, is the calling for the job is so important and so resounding in a politician mm. um, that it, it, it kind of restores my faith in them. Just it, finally, Tim, I think a lot of politicians' families have been saying to them this weekend, don't you think you mm. need to stop this now? Mm. Have your family... No one said it. No one said it. But they think but, it, um, they? I, I've no, I, I've no idea. I mean, I think I asked um, as many of my kids as I could talk to this weekend, um, uh, you know, have you had any grief for being my kid? <laughs> and the answer is no, not really. I mean, they all go, they've all been to the, the high school and the primary school in the village we live in. I'm very lucky to have a high school in the village we live in. And I think there's a normality about it. Um, so they say not. My wife's had some grief over just, you know, social media stuff, but not nice. Um... No, the answer is, um, and I love doing what I, I do, and uh, and I think that I don't think we're desperately at risk, um, and I think that you know we, there's there's got to be a balance here. I do think there's a sense in which we are a little bit reckless about our safety, a little bit because um, we're in the public eye, but it's nothing compared to the people you just mm. talked. About. Okay, right, we're going to move on. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for your question. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number to call if you'd like to put a question to. Our panel. It's 8.31 on LBC. Lucinda Horsley has the news headlines. South End is becoming a city in honour of Sir David Amos following his murder at a constituency meeting in Essex on Friday. The Conservative MP campaigned for at least two decades for the area to receive the status. George W. Bush has paid tribute to the former US Secretary of State Colin Powell following his death aged 84. The former president says he was a great public servant, a family man and a friend. England's next UEFA competition match at home will be played without the fans after trouble at Wembley for the Euro 2020 final. People without tickets managed to storm the barriers in July. LBC weather, rain clearing in the east, leaving some clear spells tonight. Breezy and staying very mild for many, a low of 12 degrees. This is LBC. Fam
question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.35. Let me reintroduce you to my panel. Mike Parry is here, Cindy Yu, Nella Farhediat and Tim Farron, who has attracted this text from Mike in Southport. <laughs> Off topic, but just want to say well done to Tim Farron for running the London Marathon for Brathay Trust. <laughs> did you really run the marathon? I did, yeah. At your age? Uh, my age. Are you mad? <laughs> yeah, I am How mad. much did you raise? Uh, I have no idea. Seven or eight grand, something like that. It was oh, right. my God. It was quite well good. Well done. Well done. Well done. I did it in a very... Was it, we talked about, you know, 666. My, my, my finishing time was four hours... 44 minutes, 44 seconds. Wow. wow. That's very impressive, That's four really hours. Impressive, yeah. Well, for an old bloke, not bad. Yeah, nearly five. Yeah, I, I can do it four hours and I'm not an old bloke, total, so total I can do it. Respect. <laughs> right, let's go to our next question. It's from uh, Chris in Stubbington. Hello, Chris. Hello, Ian. What do, what do the panel make of the collapse of energy firms? No switching at the moment and bills rising. Should councils install solar panels on their properties? Um, OK, two s slightly different questions there. Um, is it really right to say there's no switching at the moment? I think Martin Lewis, who we all have to obey in these things, has yeah. said that people shouldn't switch because obviously they won't get a very good deal mm. in the future at the moment. But I don't think that there isn't any switching going on at the moment. But the wider question, um, what do you make of the energy market at the moment and how long do you think that it's going to stay in this um, state? Mike? Well, I hope the government now are going to be panicked into a wholesale review of where we get our energy from, OK? I want to go back to fracking. I know people will say, oh, you know, it, it poisons water. No. This is where no, you fall uh, out with Tim. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> well, well, here, Tim, I, I'm, I'm delighted that we're able to talk about it. There, there is less disturbance in the ground from fracking than there is from building the tunnels underneath the home counties to put trains through on HS2, OK? I've asked people about it, and that's absolutely true. When there were coal mines all over this country, not so much in your part of the world, but certainly in the North East, South Wales, Kent, Nottinghamshire, there were, there were trembles all the time coming from the earth because we were getting our energy out of the earth. The trembles would be much less for fracking. Also, we've completely ignored the nuclear option, and Rolls-Royce now are starting to build mini like mm. al almost the size of a washing machine, many nuclear reactors, right? Because they've got to build them for transport in the future. And we need to get into that as well. We should also be in the Jackdaw oil field in the northeast off the coast of, uh, of Scotland, of Aberdeen, because we haven't yet got a proper replacement for those fuels we've got to give away. And I think it's too sudden to push all the fossil fuels out and bring all the all the green options in. It's going to bankrupt the country and it's not been thought out properly. Um, well, let's come to you, Tim Farron, on that. There's a lot, lot to yeah. get your teeth into in this. Um, the, the secret, surely, is to have a balanced energy mm. policy, and we haven't got it, have we? Mm. No. And I think, so, one of the things that people who would call themselves environmentalists have to answer for here, so I don't agree with everything that's just been said, but I agree with one thing in particular. I think that we ran away from nuclear mm. too soon. Um, I think there's lots of reasons to be concerned about it, um, uh, and obviously the waste is a fundamental issue, but most most of the waste problem with nuclear is, is historic and it's there anyway, whether we invest in it or not. And I think if you make me choose between nuclear and fossil fuels, I'm um, nuclear every day of the week. But I Did think you say that when you were leader of the Lib Dems? I, I certainly felt it. I've <laughs> Um, that's a good question, actually. That is a water cop out. I'm not sure I got asked about it very much when I was leader. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I sort of changed my views because I was, you know, I was one of those environmentalists who just bought the line that, oh, you're anti-nuclear, mm. aren't you, if you care about the planet. And the more mm. you think about it, if we want energy that is renewable, nuclear is part of it. Now, I'm not saying it should be the, the, the most important part of it, but if you look at Germany's situation, mm. their Greens led them into a, into a situation where they got rid of nuclear and now they're totally beholden on Putin and on fossil fuels. Yeah, they are. And so making I, political decisions. Yes. Based on um, it. Based yeah, on it. Exactly. So my, my whole problem, uh, I'm a vegan, I'm an environmentalist, I mean, I'm as liberal, like <laughs> solar panels on my head yeah. sort of person, right? If it was Quite up heavy. to me, well, I'll, I'll carry the weight. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I, I accept your point entirely. There has mm. to be some balance and some rational kind of process to all of this. And yeah. some of my environmentalist colleagues tend to forget that. We're like, all or nothing. Mm. I'm going to I'm gonna stick my hand to the tarmac or we're all going to mm. die. And I get that. But we, we have to adhere. We're getting information from scientists who are saying that your house is on fire and are you going to, you know, uh, try and put it out? That, so... All of this comes from good science being told to us in a bad way. That's where environmentalists <laughs> sometimes uh, perhaps get a little exacerbated. Yeah. But 
There is no solution that involves fracking and nuclear uh, sort of um, Why? energy that doesn't also involve a much bigger uh, uh, kind of thinking about global energy production. Mm -hmm. We might want to start wanting to sort things out in Britain, and so we should, and we should urge our politicians to take this very seriously, much more seriously than renegotiating human rights or whatever else we've got going on. We need our independence. America became completely but independent. Let me t- may, I, may, I, may I just say this? This yes. is important. Yes. The, the fossil fuels and the pollution that we put out into the environment don't know borders. Mm. They don't understand this is our territory and this is that other ones and sling it over the ship and it doesn't matter. We have to start thinking within a global perspective, okay. otherwise we're all doomed. Cindy, um, what can you're a spectator commentator, presumably you I think are... Mike's got a spectator <laughs> uh, article over here, so... Really? Um, uh, well, you know, you, you are presumably him in there for an advocate of the free markets. What role can the free market play here, or is this down to government decision making well like i mean i won't pretend like i'm an expert on the energy market but at the moment it's way too oligopolistic you know you you've That's especially mm, thank you <laughs> <laughs> um especially with what's happened recently to small and medium-sized providers of energy mm. you know we're giving so much power and um, you know the, the system is giving a lot of power to these oligopolies and you know consumers have very little choice over which energy supply they're going to get the services they get they're getting are not that different except for a few green options like octopus for example you don't very much have an option to go more green if you want to um or, or get better service if you want to so you know if we can marketize the energy industry then that would be great but obviously i understand that there are systematic reasons why that's not the case at the moment i'm not sure government is the reason answer to it and at the risk of agreeing too much with their, all the other panelists what government can do is to balance out that energy source it can start investing in nuclear so that in 10 years time we're not having this conversation about global supply chain of energy um, and i'm glad to see that it's doing that pivoting to that recently um, and maybe at cop 26 we'll hear more about nuclear well, but it's just not a sexy talking, green option at the moment talking of cop 26 michelle in shoreditch has texted in saying, is the UK doing enough to prepare for COP26? I don't think they are. I'm going to be at COP26. Oh, yeah. I have a show there with the Doha debates uh, to talk about how young people view... There's going well, to be a lot of hot air at this COP26. Oh, well, <laughs> that's what we're trying to stop here. Let's, let's try to exactly capture that. What we're trying to, it's exactly. <laughs> that could fuel us for a while. But... but one of the main things that I think we tend to leave out of the climate discussion, especially when we start talking about policy, about what government should do, what all of these things, is how young people feel about this discussion. And I have, in my journalism, in my in my role at Doha Debates, I have never seen such a fracturous issue as that of how climate change mm. is not only discussed, but um, what, what is implemented. Last month, I was in Milan at pre You get around, don't you? Yeah. Listen, I <laughs> did my best, Ian. That's why you've got me in this all, seat. All, all these <laughs> all these emissions That's right. I know it I skies. know it's it's yeah. well listen if my journalism means that I have to go there to, to get them to hear what they have to say because oftentimes people from Libya don't have access to our no. sort of it's, so, but that aside my point remains at pre-cop I spoke to young delegates from the Philippines through to um, Patagonia through to I think some some people were actually from Plymouth. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Very well, exotic. That's, how exotic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. You know, Plymouth. Like, I recognise that it's accent. Yeah, the equator, that. <laughs> Plymouth people on board from getting involved in these things. Um, what I was going to say is, though, you're going to COP26. Yes. The very fact that Russia, China and India might not even turn up. Yeah. Well, that's so not, Mike, that's just, not just the on, case. Just on the China the lead, one. The, like, hang on exactly. a second. The leaders might not. Well, exactly. but yes, but sure, surely the endorsement of fully backing the whole movement is when the but top man comes. Top, and if Z doesn't point, come, but, doesn't it mean... It's a, it's a bit like, say, oh, you know, send the foreign secretary. Right, Cindy. My, sorry. Please Cindy. can I push back on this? Because Z, she hasn't left the country in 600 days. Mm. He right. has not left since the pandemic started in China mm-hmm. in December, November, September, whoever you ask, 2019. So he's not going to come to Glasgow, where cases are rising in the UK, um, in order just to come for a climate conference. China is making serious strides in renewables and in green... um, policies and, and we need to start coal thinking mines. it is tr- that's true that's definitely but we need to but start not but that's exactly what <laughs> you were advocating for a moment ago when you were yep. saying that we should be looking at fracking <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 no. I mean it's 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 either this we have to start thinking globally we have to start taking young people's opinions into consideration because the biggest debilitating factor is we are expecting the world leaders to solve this problem it's not going to I, come I, from there. i love the fact that whenever mike wants to interrupt you just hold your hand out <laughs> and, he, yeah, and yeah. he obeys you <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible <laughs> 
but, very know, quickly, Mark. Uh, uh, very quickly, the most repeated statistic that people like me use is only 1% of emissions come out of the UK and 40% come out of China. That's why it's oh, vital for them to be there. Go on, then, Cindy. Go on. Well, per capita, China does not emit nearly half as much mm. as Americans do. So it's just a completely unfair and anti-economic growth to think that the Chinese people who are coming out of poverty as of 20 years ago mm. should be emitting less when it's going through the Industrial Revolution like the West went but through. But it's still emitted from hundred. that country. That's it is true, but I'm it's making. a massive country. It's a fifth yeah. of the world's population. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. it's going to be the big, one of the biggest emitters. Sure. Like, that is by sheer size of its population. And I think what's dangerous is that in the West, we still see China as a massive polluter. We're not seeing it the strides it's making in solar panels. We're not seeing the strides it's making in wind power. So in 20 years' time, when the West wants all of those things, or maybe in 10 years' time, we're going to be calling on China. And right. in the meantime, we're not looking at that. We're not looking at the technological dominance they're putting in that. Uh, well, who... We one of the issues is... No, 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 I've got... No, I've got <laughs> I, 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 just 20 seconds. If all right. Can, well, I've look, I mean, this is a real, a real challenge for a, for a Democrat, <laughs> is that to tackle climate change effectively in a place like the United Kingdom, you've got to win the electorate round. Yeah. China, you don't. Yeah. Um, and lots of countries like... So that in many ways, it is about engaging with you know, senior people in China, Xi, and others as well, in the diplomatic sense, to try and move them along. But I think you're right. There is, there is evidence that China is taking this seriously, just not as seriously as they should. Well, who, who ever thought that a discussion on energy policy could be so interesting? So thank you, thank you all for that. We'll have another discussion on something very interesting in just a moment. It's 8.47. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. And Lindsay Hoyle, of course, is Speaker of the House of Commons. Wherever you turn, there's nothing but warm words for this extraordinary politician whom we lost on Friday. Your recollections of the man. You must have crossed him in corridors many, many times. David was a great friend to all. He was a friend of my father's when he was in the House. So David brought warmth. He was a politician that loved his job. He got the best out of the job. He's done something that we all would love to do. He's united politicians and brought us together not just in grief, but making sure that the democratic process survives. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. In the
Last Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 10 to 9, we have Mike, Cindy, Nelifar and Tim with us still. And this is, this is one of those questions which is very different and I'm looking forward to your answers on this. It's from Idris in Kensington. Idris, hi, what's your question please? Uh, hi, Mr. Ian Dale. Thank you very much. I'm going to put it as short as I can so I can earn your love, Mr. Ian. So this is my question. <laughs> At what stage United Kingdom will be independent from the decisions of United States? Wow. Oh, there's a lot behind that question. Mm. Um, An awful lot. Cindy. Well, I mean, I, I guess Idris is probably thinking about foreign policy the most. And I think on foreign policy, Britain has got a problem in that when... Britain stopped being the world hegemon, you know, the British Empire. The power moved very smoothly to America. And what we're seeing at the moment is that America is trying desperately to keep on hold on to its crown in the rise of China. And Britain can't really separate it from America that much without losing its current stake status in the world. Um, by which I mean, we are really you know, riding on American coattails because there's so much cultural affinity, there's so much affinity between the peoples uh, in terms of language, so that when we stopped being the world hegemon, it didn't really feel like that because America was so, you know, in sync in so many ways. We could, we could consume American culture, we can watch American news, all this sort of stuff. So I think, you know, given the prowess of America at the moment, I don't th really think Britain can separate without, you know, risking China getting stronger in the face of America. So, you know, it, it's a difficult one because obviously we would love to be a sovereign country when it comes to foreign policy. But as we saw from Afghanistan and as we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific right now, there's too many decisions that you need America's help on. And America is still the best bet for Britain when it comes Absolutely. to who you want okay. to lead the world order. Nelifal. Uh, I disagree wholeheartedly. Um, I think riding on the coattails and I'll sort of that, that special. Yeah, <laughs> let you go at well, it. Well, well, just to be clear, that special relationship has turned into a toxic one. Well, um, I don't disagree with that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you don't disagree, but um, I really want to labour this point. We are now in a toxic relationship with America. We are no longer in a beneficial, symbiotic one where one partner gives as much as the other and receives as much as the other. The intelligence work that we do uh, across Britain and Europe and America is vital for our safety and security here in the West. And there are p uh, parties um, in the Far East, uh, in Russia, who, who are our natural enemies. And I get that and I'm with that. But when we decide to hitch our wagon, lock stock to something like America, which in herself, she is struggling, fighting, burning on the streets, shooting each other down on the streets every day. We accept so much more than we ever receive. And I am quite frankly, disillusioned by this idea. It's like going back to a boyfriend that's constantly being awful to you and being like, he'll change this time. This time he'll think of me. He won't. Um, and the sooner that we create a new relationships, a new understanding of the world... But who with? Look, who with Nella for? Well, here's, that's Seriously. a very... Well, yeah. it's, it's, the world is long past days when we can just make friends based on alliances like NATO mm. uh, or, or wars that we have fought in the past. Yeah. We have to consider what the biggest challenges are in our future climate change, mass displacement of people, uh, uh, resource wars. Yeah. We're going to be fighting for water as much as oil exactly, and energy. Exactly, but we have to side with the country that's most able to help us through all those huge problems. I still think it's America. I'm glad we're allied to America. I want to stay with America. Of course it's got its problems, but can you imagine being allied to China, for I instance? You know, with the Uyghur situation and everything else that they do against human rights. I still think America are our best bet. They're our best bet to the degree that the relationship is symbiotic why isn't our best relationship with france or germany or because Europe? america's why huge. did we decide america's huge as it's very prosperous it is it is also dogmatic it is also incredibly fierce in the way that it protects america will not hesitate as a nation as a polit political structure as an industrial military complex mm. to protect itself at the expense of anyone that includes us is that not something to be fearful no, about? no but Completely russia is true. exactly the same doesn't I'm, any I'm country sorry. do that yeah russia is exactly the <laughs> you, same but we call us. them our best friends right so we yeah. say well, this yeah. is yeah. a moral but, but, friendship so we we know that over time can i just I ask mean, you do, do you guys all think that america would not 
wholeheartedly sort of walk past any British interest if they think it no, serves their interests. No, I completely agree with you on that. Like the midterm election, for example. They, they've done it in the past. You they know, just think, did it right now for the midterm election. Think, yeah, yes. think back to Grenada in 1983. Yeah. Mm. Think back in some ways. I mean, they did help us in the Falklands, but there were plenty, the of, plenty of Americans <laughs> that did not want to. Tim Farron. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex question. I think the Afghanistan uh, retreat, betrayal... Um, and I think it felt like a betrayal yes. uh, because whether I, I thought on balance we were right to go in when we did I opposed the Iraq war but I thought on balance it was right to go into Afghanistan and the presence over the last 10 years was not so much a war as a kind of peacekeeping operation and a freedom keeping operation and our withdrawal you know whether the intelligence was all wrong or whether we knew what was going to happen and still did it anyway it feels absolutely awful for the people of Afghanistan but it also feels like the moment where the West has abdicated leadership mm. and as somebody who's always has often been critical of the West and uh, and of liberal interventionism and all the rest of it, it actually gives me pause for thought because for all of the faults of Western countries and America in particular, let's remember what we do share and that is a common belief in human rights, uh, an impartial judiciary, democratic elections and all the rest of it and just think who we're now ceding control of the world agenda to people who don't believe in those things Ooh, by uh, and absolutely. large. So, I mean, you know, I'm bound to say this, I think our withdrawal from the European Union is problematic because it means we've only got American. Right. Um, now, if we'd pursued a different kind of exit from Europe that kept us in the single market, we would be in that wonderful sweet spot where we were Commonwealth, US and Europe. We were at a massively important junction T Tim, do you, in do the you, world do you network. Trust America? And Sorry, do you trust America more than France? Because I don't trust you, Trump more than France. Well, 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 you know, I, Trump I, I don't... I, let me not, break it to you. Trump isn't president. I'm not so. I'm not so. I'm not so chauvinist as to suggest that the French or the Americans are any more I don't trustworthy trust than any other. I think they France are, would stab us in the back. Two, and, you know, they are. Like they are two countries yeah. who will act in their own self-interest. Yeah. The difference being that France has pooled its sovereignty with 26 other well, countries. Fun. Yeah. America is in a very reactionary, populist state right now. We saw what happened with the Trump administration. Those people, those beliefs, those ideologies haven't gone away. They're just waiting for another demagogue. And when we ally ourselves with America, we have to accept that they're worse demons well, are in the good and bad that. in all countries. We have to accept that. I mean, yeah. But the leader of the saying, free world yeah, being that? Well, leader of the know. field, they can't win America. One minute they're the world's policemen and they're getting criticised for going into other people's mm. countries. Next minute they pulled out and said, we're going to be completely insular yeah. inside America and they're still getting criticised. American insularity is a world. great threat. Reluctant as yeah. I am to draw this discussion to a close, <laughs> I'm going to because we've got a final text for the end of the programme. We always like to do something vaguely amusing. Um, Rahim in Sheffield. Olivia and Oliver have been the most popular names in England and Wales since 2015. What would, you na what would your name have been if you were born into the other sex? Oh, my God. Shall I, I'll give you a... Uh, well, if you were a boy. Well, if your parents named... If, yeah, because my parents told me... Well, my mother actually has denied this, but she... <laughs> I'm sure that she told me years and years ago that she was going to call me Emma if I'd been oh, a girl. Yeah. Now, nice. think about that. Think about being at a high school, being called Emmerdale. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. I would have loved it. <laughs> Think of the ribbing I would have taken. You'd have never Probably lived absolutely. it down. Um, I, I'd have settled for Michaela because my name is Michael, so I'll, yeah. I'll have Michaela. I think you're more for Mildred. <laughs> Cindy. Oh, God, a fun, it's, I mean, it's probably something Chinese. It's not going to mean anything to you. Well, go on, no, you fix something. Well, I, can, I can tell you, though, that you know, in China, it's quite common to name girls boys' names because you Is wish it? that they were a boy. Oh, dear, that's um, terrible. My yeah, mum has a very masculine name, um, not because my parents didn't want Sue. her. Her, mas her name <laughs> means oh, sea oh, We know eagle. how that ended. Yeah. Her name means sea eagle. Which is very masculine in China for Chinese names. So that's my offering. But, uh, okay. Nafa? Oh, come off it. You know I'd be called Abdullah. <laughs> <laughs> Tina. Yeah, Tina would do. I love it. That would do. Um, my, my sister's two years younger than me was called Joanne, so I imagine it would have been that. Oh, that's a boy a bit, called that, That's a bit boring. Not, I'm calling your sister boring. She's I not boring. Hasten, <laughs> hasten to mention. Listen, thank you very much indeed to all of you. Tim Farron, Nelifar Hadiat, Cindy Yu and Mike Parry. If you missed any of the programme or want to catch up on older episodes, believe it or not, you know, I was looking at the figures for the Cross Question podcast the other day. People are still listening to ones that happened like two years ago. Really? It's really that's weird. Fantastic. But anyway, they're all there on the, wherever you get your podcast from. Mm. And of course, you can watch all the programmes on YouTube and global player.
In a moment, we are going to return to the tragic killing of Sir David Amos. It's the first opportunity that I've had really to discuss all the issues around it in detail with you. I want to get your reaction. You, if you want to pay tribute to Sir David, if you want to talk about MP security, basically it's going to be an open hour. You can phone in on anything you like with regard to the killing of Sir David Amos. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Southend is becoming a city in honour of Sir David Amos after he was killed in Essex on Friday. The Conservative MP campaigned for at least two decades for the area to receive the status. A special church service has taken place after a...